Hello, this is Nathan Stuke, and uh, thank you so much for joining me for this Whisper You uh, talking about dealing with your pain points. You know, this year we've been interviewing different people that are prominent in our industry, and today uh, you just get to listen to me, um, but hopefully I've got some good information for you and I'm uh, going to be talking about pain points, which we all have. Um, I always like to know a little bit about the speaker, so a little bit on my background. Um, I was a serial entrepreneur. I didn't know that's what uh, what I was. I just thought everybody um, thought the way I did. I, I had a lemonade stand. I had three employees because my dyslexia, I was always in summer school. So I had three employees, my brother and my two best friends, and, and we sold sold candy and, and lemonade. Uh, I mowed lawns, uh, did that uh, for 20, 30 lawns a weekend. Um, I also sold candy in high school. Um, it just didn't quite look like this. Uh, it was more like this. Um, whoops, it was more like this because you uh, you couldn't sell candy uh, in school, but I kind of did it anyway. Uh, and then I was also a loan shark. Now, before you go turn me in, uh, I was a really nice loan shark. So what I did was uh, I would loan you money in junior high. I'd make you sign a piece of paper that said, I, you know, so-and-so will pay Nathan Stoop back. And I think in seventh and eighth grade, that's a big deal. You sign your name to something. So if I lent you $2, and you pay me back the next day, no extra cost. Um, but if you didn't pay me back, every day you didn't pay me back, it doubled. Um, that, that's fair, right? That they, it doubled in price. Uh, and holidays and weekends and days you miss school or days I miss school didn't count. See, I was very, very nice. Um, but what ultimately shut me down was the school started looking back at all their absences and they, they realized that the people who owed me money were the ones that were absent all the time. So they, uh, they, they shut me down and said I couldn't do that. Uh, but that's a little bit about me, a little bit about my entrepreneurial uh, journey going through, just trying to figure out uh, how to solve people's problems. And, and through all those, you hit pain points. And today we're going we're gonna to talk about those pain points. And I'm not going to talk about um, specific examples. I have specific examples, but that's not my goal. My goal here yeah, isn't to say that you are, um, you know, here's what you should do in this situation and that situation. You, you're definitely not, um, your situation is definitely different than mine. Um, but what I'm trying to do with this today is to help you identify your pain points. And then what are some ways to get out of those? Uh, so as we're going through this, please ask me any questions you have. You can put them in the comments. Uh, and I'll, I'll stop right there and answer them because this is about uh, about you uh, learning what you need to learn and, and not necessarily about me. Uh, and today's presentation might be a little longer than most we do, so hopefully uh, you can make it through it. Uh, and we will post the recording if you have to jump off. Uh, so today we're going to talk about how do you know you have a pain point, evaluate the root cause of that pain point, and then how do you solve them? What are some lasting things that you have to solve? Um, so when you talk about these pain points, I think it's important to understand that you know a lot of people think that companies grow like this right the myth growth that oh i'm just on this nice trajectory sometimes it's a you know it's a straight up right you have the hockey stick but they really feel that growth is just incremental one step after the other uh and, and in reality uh it's like this it's up it's down it's up it's down you you you, you increase your growth you grow well and then you start running into problems and then you grow some more and that's what's called hitting the ceiling. Uh, and that's the evolution versus revolution. And, and EOS kind of teaches this, that that evolution versus revolution is, is what, you're, what you're dealing with. And when you look at it, it's okay. It, if you realize that the yellow path is the path that we're going to take, then you can say, okay, I, I understand that's going to happen. And now what do I need to do to break through that ceiling? And there's, there's ceilings at multiple different levels, right? So there's a ceiling at an organizational level. So I'm the CEO of Whisper. Um, if I hit a ceiling personally in my life, uh, then there's a chance that our organization will hit that ceiling as well, right? I have to break through that organization since I'm the, the top of that organization. Uh, the department level, right? So maybe you're running a department or just your department in general is stuck. You, you can't do more installs and you're not quite sure what you have to do to change that. Uh, and then individually, you as a person, are you somebody who, who needs to increase their skills or their knowledge in order to break through the ceiling? And, and I think, you know, it, it, hitting the ceiling is inevitable, right? It, it's taxes and death. Um, and as long as we know that and we, we know that it's okay to hit that ceiling, 
then we can accept now that we just have to fix it. It isn't that you're a bad leader or a bad owner or, or a bad person. It's just you've hit something and you need to continue to grow. And we've, we've always joked here at Whisper and said that, you know, if, if you don't grow personally, um, Whisper will outgrow you, right? What you used to do two years ago doesn't do what we need it to do right now because we're twice as big. Uh, and, and we have to figure out how to how to identify hitting those ceilings. And we're going to talk about that. Ceilings are kind of the pain points you hit. Um, so I think it's also important to look at you know, this quote. If you don't know where you're going, uh, any road will get you there. And, and I think if, if I ask, you know, how many of you are visionaries? How many of you can kind of see into the future? I'm an off-the-charts visionary person. Uh, and that's good and bad, um, but it's it just it, the way it is. So I see what's happening in the future and, and kind of can predict sometimes very bad at it, sometimes good at it. Um, but I predict kind of, hey, this is what a problem we're going to have. And I set that course. Uh, but this quote is really getting at that if, if you don't know where you're going, it doesn't matter how you get there, right? Any road will take you there. But I do know where I'm going and I do know where I want to go. Um, so... We kind of look at this, you know, like your A to Z versus your ABC. So those of us that are that are are visionaries, we jump to Z very, very easily. So if if you're somebody who's a visionary, usually you're entrepreneurs um, and everything. When you look at it, and you say, "Wow, I can see that to get to Z, you know, Z is the outcome. Z is what I'm working for." A lot of times, we have a hard time articu articulating the A's, the B's, and the C's. So we set out on this path to Z. And we hit these pain points along the way and we're like, wait a minute, I, why are we having this? I didn't see that as it was coming through. Um, whereas if you're more operational based, if you're an operations person and, and I say, hey, here's Z, this is what the perfect world, this is what I want it to look like. Um, the first thing that comes into your mind is, holy cow, I don't even see that. I can't even get to Z. How do I get to Z? And you start thinking about, well, the first step I need to do is this. And then the next step I need to do is this. And then the next step, again, it's not right or wrong. Um, but it's it's a different way of thinking, and it's in a way that we have to think about um, because you're going to hit pain points differently depending on what type of person you are. An operational person will hit different pain points or see different pain points, and it's great to have a combination of both. And uh, EOS is somebody that the, that model talks about the integrator versus the visionary and how they really, really need to work together. Um, but the way you kind of set up yourself to deal with your pain points better and know when you hit them is through strategic planning. So I can have a whole hour's conversation on strategic planning for sure. There's so much work that goes into strategic planning. But again, remember, if you don't know where you want to go, any pain point you hit, any ceiling you hit, it might completely divert you, right? And nowadays they call it pivoting. And don't get me wrong, sometimes pivoting is really, really good. But if you don't know what your outcome is, you're just going to be lost in the wind and going back and forth and not really knowing where you're trying to get. So you might be trying to get around pain points that you should be solving. You should be going through instead of uh, getting around them. Uh, so strategic planning, creating goals. Where do we want to go? How do we want to get there? Knowing and understanding your numbers, right? If you don't know where your history, it's kind of hard to predict where you're going. Uh, and then plotting the course for your company. I really like... Jim Collins is good to great. Uh, he talks about you know putting the right person on the seat in the bus and, and how that works. And you guys probably heard me talk about this before. I, it's a great analogy for what, what he's trying to say is you have to put the right people in the right seat. I firmly believe that. I just don't believe in the bus because the only person on the bus that's doing any work is the bus driver. I believe in more of the sailing analogy. So if you are the CEO of the company, you're the captain, you're setting the course for your company, uh, and it's okay for you to go down and mop the deck. It's okay for you to help them raise the anchor. But just remember, if you're not leading the company, no one is. And no one can fill your role doing that. Uh, so I like to look at it that way. Um, a couple other books I think that are really, really good to help you with strategic planning is Traction, the, the Get a Grip, and then also um, Simon Sinek's uh, The Infinite Game. Uh, it just it sums it up so nicely as to we're in the game to play the game, not in the game to win the game. The game of business, there, there are definitely losers, um, but you never know who the winner is. You never know when the end, end of the game is like in a sports one. So I, I love his book, and those will help you with some of that strategic planning. 
So let's look now, how do you know you have a pain point, right? So, so really, what, what, are you, what are you looking for? Well, how do you know you really, it takes time. And, and I would love to sit up here and say, well, listen, when, when you hit this number of employees, here's the pain point you're gonna have. And then when you hit this number of employees, here's the pain point. And then when you have this outside challenge, but that's just not, not reality. And really the way you solve pain points, the way you identify that you're hitting a bottleneck, some of them are obvious, right? Wrong person, wrong seat right? They don't fit the company culture and they can't do their job. Those are pretty obvious. But what if you have a right person, which means they fit your company culture, they're a nice person, but they're in the wrong seat. They're incapable of doing their job or they're only capable of doing it about 80%, right? They're not a, not a rock star. Those are sometimes very, very hard to identify. And it really, really takes time. You have to devote time to evaluating your pain points, where you are struggling. Are you struggling? What's a symptom and what's what's a root cause? And, and a lot of it has to do with this, you know, important but not urgent. Um, I had a really hard time with this early on in, in Whisper. Everything was putting out fires, everything. You know, I climbed towers, I did installs, whatever it took to keep the customer happy. And then I wasn't working on the business. I wasn't seeing where we were struggling. I was too far down in the weeds to really pop my head up and say, wow, this is where if we just changed this, we wouldn't have the problems we have. Um, so you really need to be working in the second quadrant here, the important but not urgent. This is something that if you're working in that quadrant, um, you're thinking about your business, you're understanding where maybe you're struggling, where you need to do more work. Um, nobody's beating down your door to say, solve this problem, solve this problem. Um, but it is very, very important that you get it done. So once you've kind of identified your pain point, or a lot of times it's easy to identify all the problems, right? But really, what is a pain point? What, what is something I need to be fixing versus a symptom, right? So we have spent a lot of time at Whisper fighting symptoms and then solving the symptoms and then wondering why it didn't solve the problem, <laughs> right? That there's, oh my goodness, that, that, that didn't fix the problem. We still aren't able to add as many customers as we want, or we still have more cancellations, but we, we solved this problem over here, what's going on? And it, and it comes down to evaluating the root cause. Uh, and when you evaluate the root cause, there's several things you have to think about to really dive into that. And I, I pulled this up from McKinsey and Company, and I said, "Oh, this is awesome! I'm gonna I'm gonna share this with them, and I'm gonna show them the five different steps to root cause problem solving." And then I looked at step number two: assess current uh, state root causes. Wait a minute. Isn't that like using the definition of the word in the definition, right? If this is their root cause problem solving um, five elements, how can assess the current state of the root causes be a step? Um, so I, I tried to break it down a little bit more in detail and, and look at that. What are really these root causes? Um, so when you're looking at a root cause, you really need to seek data and, and I don't mean analysis paralysis, right? Sometimes people are like, well, I just don't have the right data, so I can't make any decisions. Well, okay, if your data has been consistently wrong by say 20%, maybe you can still see trends or, or maybe, and, and we also had a lot of times our employees would come to us and they're saying, listen, we gotta stop doing this or we have to start doing this. We have all these problems, it happens all the time. Oh, okay, well, could you track every time that it happens and then let us know when it happens so we can evaluate, you know, is this a major problem we have to deal with or a small problem? And amazingly, nine times out of 10, you know, after two months of them tracking, they'd come back and like, well, it really hasn't happened recently. So I'm not quite sure. It's like, wait a minute, you came to us saying that it was so, so important that you had to, to solve this right now. But yet when we asked you for the empirical data to back it up, it turns out there wasn't me. So it, it's interesting, you seek data uh, to either validate um, that you, maybe you have the root cause or that maybe this is just a symptom. There has to be more in there. Um, ask lots of questions. Uh, this is something, well, why is it that way? You know, you have to ask five, why like five times. Well, why is that? Well, why is that? Um, the other thing I like to see is when you ask questions, ask people like, what do you mean by that? Because I understand what my definition of a word is, but your definition may be different. And even though we're having a good conversation, well, tell me more about that. What, what do you mean? What do you mean when you say cancellations uh, are high in this area? Oh, you know, so, so we, we have to try to evaluate what, what that is, what people are meaning when they ask, and asking a lot of questions is a good way to do that. 
I think another thing is ask ridiculous questions as well. This is kind of fun. You know, so we have our calf build. We have six years to do the build. We're just over a year into it. Um, and a couple months ago, I asked my team, you know, how do we complete the calf build in a year? Oh, well, you got to give me more money. Okay, that's not what I asked. I said, how do you complete the calf build in a year? Assuming money aside, I, I'm not worried about that. What I'm worried about is how do we physically get it done? Because even if I gave them more money, they probably wouldn't still be able to get calf done in a year. So we asked these ridiculous questions. Uh, the other question we asked is, how could we never have a customer call us again? Now, I want a relationship with our customers and I want our customers to be able to call us. We have an older demographic that uses a lot of our service in the rural areas and they prefer to pick up the phone versus text or, or chat with somebody. But we asked that question, what would we have to do as a company to never have a customer need to call us? Well, you know, that's impossible. Okay, it's great, I'm glad it's impossible, but what would we have to do? Well, we'd have to have self-help. We'd have to have service that's amazing that they never need to call us for in the first place. Oh, awesome. You know, and so we work through all those. So you need to ask very, very ridiculous questions. And even though you may not be able to actually implement the solution to that ridiculous question, it should put you on a path to getting to what a uh, root cause or maybe some of the things standing in your way. Uh, audit without blame. This is a really, really good one as well is after the fact, um, everybody's usually defensive. Something didn't go well. You know, guys, we didn't turn up this tower in the right amount of time or we didn't have the number of customers. What are we doing wrong? What are we doing well? What do we, what, what do we need to do better? Take ownership of what you need to do. And audit without blame is a little hard. Uh, a lot of times people get into the defensive. Well, gee, I'm going to lose my job if I speak up and tell them that I ordered the wrong part and it's my fault that that tower took two extra weeks than it did. Okay, well, an audit without blame says, I understand we messed up, but I want us to be much, much better next time. Please tell me all the problems we had so we can make sure that never happens again. Okay, you ordered the wrong part. Is that a one-off time? Or does that happen all the time? Do we need to get you better training? Do you need to understand better? Are we not identifying the parts clear enough for you? You know, so there's definitely definitely ways to do it, but this is a, it's a tricky one and it's kind of hard to implement this fully um, in in what your uh, in your companies. Um, also, I challenge everything that goes back to asking a lot of questions. Uh, and then, what is your frame of reference? Uh, this is the the book that I have on here called "What Is Your Problem." I won't go into any of their examples, but I would just recommend that you read that book. Um, it talks about you know solving the wrong problem. What problem are you trying to solve? And if you're solving the wrong one, you, you won't ever actually get to the outcome that you want. Uh, and then the other book I have on here that I really like is Change Your Questions, Change Your Life. Um, this one talks about our, our perceptions and how we can ask questions better and, and what we need to try to solve, um, what questions we need to ask to, to get to what we really want, our outcomes that we really want. So that's a little bit about root cause and what I, I think about how we can solve um, down to what our actual root causes and some of the steps we take. So now let's look at how, how do we solve these pain points? Well, really, I, I think it's, you know, I've been an entrepreneur most of my life and in that entrepreneurship role, your job is to solve problems, right? And, you know, our everything is possible our, our only limitations are those we set for ourselves. Both of those are so, so true. You know, we did our first 12 acquisitions. We've done almost 40 of them now, anything from a five, five customers up to 2,500 customers. And our first 12 were seller financed. Now, when we came up with that concept, I didn't even know what seller financed was. All I knew is I couldn't get a bank to give, give me money. So if I was going to buy you out, you had to fund it, right? You had to say, okay, Nathan, you may have my company, and you will pay me thousands of dollars a month over the next two or four or five years. Uh, and I'm okay with that. And, and as I was just actually had in a meeting today with my financial advisor and he's like, listen, people don't do that. I'm like, what do you mean people don't do that? He goes, seller finance. That is not something that happens in the real world. I'm like, oh, well, out of our 40 acquisitions, almost every component of our seller uh, of our deals has a piece of seller finance in it. It's just what we had to do. And he says, yes, but that's because you think of things differently, right? Where we had no limitations where I've talked to so many WISP owners that said, well, I wanted to buy that company over there, but I never could come up with the funds. Okay. If you couldn't come up with the funds, how are you going to do it? What's your options? Well, the bank wouldn't give me any funding. Okay. <laughs> you know, work around it. Uh, and, and to bring this a little bit closer to home with what we have going on today is if I were to tell you that 
everyone in the world had to work from home and our kids had to go to school from home, if I would have told you that two years ago, you would have said, awesome, Nathan, thanks for being a visionary. We'll get to that in two to three decades, right? Because it's impossible, not enough bandwidth, that the curriculum isn't set up to be taught online. There's no way people can work from home and still get work done. Um, but really, when you look at it, we're all working from home. We're all, we're all learning from home. Don't get me wrong. We may not like it, right? And it may not be perfect. Uh, I can remember several of the first days my kids doing online learning. It was like, whoa, this is not going to work. But we solved it, right? We, we, we figured out. So we had a limiting belief that the entire workforce could not work from home. And an outside influence forced us to do it. And lo and behold, we were able to do it. So when you have an internal belief that you can't solve a problem or, or this is just the way it's always going to be, you're limiting yourself. What can you do to kind of think about things a little differently? And, and this is where I really, really like EOS. So EOS, the Entrepreneur's Operating System, it has a section in its level 10 called IDS, or they call them IDS. I call them IDS, but IDS, identify, discuss, and solve, right? So you identify. What, what do you want? What is the problem? And, and again, this is a, a short little sentence that you say. This is you know, maybe two sentences where you talk about well, what is the problem? What, what, what are the issues? And sometimes when you describe what the uh, identifying what the problem is, you realize you're, you're identifying a symptom and really the root cause is something different. Um, but you identify it for your team and then you discuss it, right? You, you discuss what's going on. You, well, this is this issue I see. Well, no, I see it this way. Maybe we could solve it this way. Um, and, and you have a healthy discussion. And this is where you want everyone around your, that meeting to give their two cents. Well, this is the way I see it. Well, maybe, oh, I agree with that, but how can we do it differently? Or can I add on to that? Um, once you start hearing people repeat themselves, then it's just politicking. Your discussion is over. They're just trying to hit their point home. Uh, and then ultimately you want to solve. What is the takeaway? What do we have to do to move forward? Because I, I can't tell you the number of times we've had recurring problems, right? Where it's the same problem every week. Somebody brings it up and we talk about it, but we don't solve it right? Yes, we've identified it. Yes, we've discussed it to ad nauseum, but then we don't solve it. And, and we have to have that solved. What are the to-dos walking out of that meeting that says, okay, I'm going to get these done in the next seven days, and that will solve the problem that we're having. Um, so I really like that segment of, of EOS because it, it helps you solve your problems and helps you identify down to what the root cause is and then work towards a solution instead of talking about it. Well, now you might be saying, okay, Nathan, that's fine. Solving is great, but, but solving problems is hard, right? I mean, making decisions is really, really hard. Um, you know, Monday morning back quarterbacks, um, I can't tell you the number of employees that after we make a decision, they are more than happy to tell us why that decision is a bad one, right? They're more than happy to tell us how we should have made a different decision. And I can't believe you didn't do it this way. Well, several of those employees, we have taken them and put them in a management role and said, awesome, you go solve the problem then. Uh-oh, amazingly, once it's a real problem and their decisions have real outcomes in real things, they, 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 they freeze up, they can't make a decision or they don't make the best decisions or whatever. So you have to know that making a decision is actually pretty hard and it's okay. It's okay that it's hard, but you need to make a decision, right? I think it's the Marines, the, they're the army that says, you know, if you... Making no decision is making a decision. Make a decision and start moving forward with it, and then you can pivot as you need to, but, but don't not make a decision. So a couple of the books I really like is Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. Um, this one, it, it's really neat how it kind of ties it all together and how you can make decisions with the information you have today. The other one I like is Thinking in Bets. You know, we, we all think that we take all the information, we process it down, and then logically we make the best decision moving forward. But really, when, when we do that and then the decision doesn't work out, you know, we beat ourselves up and we say, well, gee, you know, how come you didn't know that piece of information or why did you make that decision or whatever? But really what this book lays out is that you're thinking in bets where I'm betting that I'm making the best decision or I don't have all the information. So I'm going to make the best decision I can, and 70% of the time it'll be right, 30% will be wrong, or in this case, wow, we really don't have a lot of information. Like, if you guys remember back to when COVID was first hitting, 
um, we had some feedback from some of our employees that said, well, you know, you guys could have handled COVID better. You could have stopped making all these chops and changes with the procedures. Like, what do they have to do? Are they working from home? Or are they not? And when do they have to take their temperature? And when do they have to stay home? And I said, awesome. Hindsight's 2020. Yeah, we made a lot of decisions and we were having information, new information come out sometimes hourly as to what we had to do. What were the state mandates? What were the federal mandates? Were we considered um, an essential service? Were we not considered essential service? How are we going to go into people's houses? You know, so all of that information was flying at us. And if you look back, we probably would have made inf decisions differently. We definitely would have made de decisions differently had we been looking back at it, having all that information. But at the time, we didn't have all that information. So when you think in bets, that helps you frame your reference of, wow, I am doing a pretty good job of making decisions because not all the decision making is, is perfect. We don't have all the information. Um, so another way to kind of think about making decisions, if you're kind of stuck, analysis paralysis, and I, I love asking for advice from people. Um, I think most of the reason I love asking for advice is because I know I don't have to follow it. <laughs> a lot of people, you know, ask for device, advice and then they feel like they have to follow it. Oh, no, no, no. I love learning from other people's mistakes. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to ask tons of people, well, what did you do in this situation? Why did you do this? What happened? But I know I need to formulate my own opinion as to what the outcome needs to be. The other thing you can do is kind of take yourself out of the situation. So, okay, I, this is the situation I'm in. What if I were to bring in a whole nother leadership team? Or what if I brought in another, an outside CEO? What would they do in my case? Well, of course they would do this, this, and this, or they would remove this person, they would do. Okay, so now I have a slightly different perspective. Now you can ask somebody else what they would do as well, but, but sometimes you can just go through that mental exercise. Uh, or you have a peer group, like I'm in YPO, uh, there's EO, Vistage, a couple of those where you have a peer group where you can say, hey, this is the situation I'm in. Has anybody else been in a situation similar uh, to that? And can you do an experience share? Don't give me advice, but can you do an experience share with that? Um, I also have an executive coach. I have an executive coach for myself, executive coach for our team. Uh, we have an executive coach for our managers. And we technically have an executive coach for anybody in the company who wants to be coached um, because it is nice having an outside person pop you over the head. Maybe when you're not seeing things, you, you, you say you're seeing them, but you're not seeing them right or guide you and, and really pump you up and say, hey, you're doing awesome. Keep, keep going. So the other one I think is include your employees in the solution. Um, a lot of times problems, solutions to problems dictated from on high, you know, so leadership team solves the problem um, per the knowledge we have, and then we push it down into the rest of the company. The problem never really gets solved because you don't get buy-in from those other companies, you don't, or the other employees, and you don't get buy-in from what the real problem is. And again, you might be solving a, a symptom, but not really solving the root cause. Uh, and one of the books I love for that is Extreme Ownership. Uh, it's a great, great book. Uh, and, it, and it talks about what does it mean to have extreme ownership? Um, like one of the examples I, I think they gave was that, you know, well, I, I didn't know what time to show up for the meeting. Oh, okay. So last week we talked about having a meeting on Friday and you didn't know what time to show up. Do you think you could have asked? Do you think you should have asked? Is it on me to tell you exactly what time it is? Or maybe we did tell you, we just, you didn't see the email. And it, it talks about that extreme ownership. Like if I'm not getting the information I need, or if I'm not getting the care from my leader that I need, uh, or the people below me, they're not doing, I, I have to take complete ownership of that. It is my responsibility, my fault. And what am I going to do to set out to fix it instead of, well, you just didn't send me the, the, the time for the meeting. So I didn't show up. Well, that's not taking any ownership at all. So I, I love that book. The other one is carrots and sticks don't work. Uh, I am not a, big fan on individual bonuses. Um, I, I like more corporate bonuses where if the whole company wins, the, um, the, the you know, everybody wins. Um, but, but he has some very interesting things where he talks about, you know, be careful what you measure and be careful what you incentivize because you will get it and it will be gamed and people will figure out how to game the system to get the incentive that they want. Uh, and then a lot of times once you take that incentive away, uh, then things become worse than they were before. Right. So I'm going to incentivize all of our installers to get, you know, customer reviews and I'm going to pay them ten dollars a month for all those customer reviews, each one they get. And then six months in, you're getting a ton of customer reviews and it's awesome. You take that bonus away because it's like I proved to you, you can do it. 
you're going to see a pretty big slide down to where they, they stop even caring about it because it, they used to, they were incentivized to do it and, and not understood why they needed to get it done. So uh, another big thing with solving your pain points is that you need to set clear expectations um, and, and you need to keep your emotions in check. Uh, a, a lot of times people, you know, when you're solving these very, very point, this can be at home too, when you're solving problems at home is when a lot of times the emotions get, get the better of people, but it's kind of more like that ticking time bomb. Like I've put up with so much, I've put up with so much, I've put up with so much, and now I'm just going to explode. And I just, we have to solve this problem. Um, but that's really not the best way. I, I love the, the Crucial Conversations book. It really sets out a good, good way on how you have high stakes conversations and solve what you really need to solve um, because it, it really, really helps you understand what is the root of the conversation that needs to happen, what is the outcome that I want. It helps you understand that. Um, the other one I like is measure what matters. Um, that kind of goes back to setting clear expectations. Uh, when you set your clear expectations, it's easier to hold the people to those expectations. If you say, well, I just want to grow next year. Oh, okay. And then you had in your mind that you wanted to grow X percent and somebody else had in their mind they wanted to grow Y percent. And then you get to the end of the year and you're like, we didn't grow where we wanted. And both of you are saying, yeah, we didn't grow where we wanted. Um, but it turns out that neither one of you articulated what your expectation, what did you mean by growth? Was growing by one customer by the end of the year good enough? Or did it need to be by 100 customers or 200 or 1,000 or 2,000? What does that mean? So setting those clear expectations. Uh, is definitely um, an important thing. Another way, so, so that was kind of high level what you can do on your teams. I think another thing that really helps you solve a problem personally is that you need to grow your leadership ability, right? You need to become a better leader because you're going to identify pain points faster. You're going to be able to solve them faster. You're going to be able to get to the root cause of them faster. And one of the ways you do this is to know who you are. Uh, I've talked about it before, the, our built to lead, building a strong core, what do you stand for? So at Whisper, the customer is our true north. That is what we're going for. Now, we don't give people a GPS to get there, right? We give them a compass. True north means, hey, this is where we're striving for, um, but it's not a GPS, because if it was a GPS, all I'm doing is hiring robots. I want people to think, and I want people to understand that Everything is not cut and black and white, cut and dry with business. You have to do the best you can in the situation you are. So we're giving you a compass to get you to true north. And if you know who you are as a leader and you're not wishy-washy about your values and you're not wishy-washy about what you believe in and what you will stand for and what you won't, that makes it a lot easier for people to follow you. Because if they one person comes to you and says, oh, Nathan said to do this and that's the way we're going because that seemed to be what he was hot to trot on. And then the next person comes to me and says, oh, well, Nathan, we should work on this. And I'm like, yeah, we should work on that. And, and then now we have two people on our leadership team or in the company going in different directions because I wasn't steadfast in our customer is true north. What are we doing to provide amazing service for them? Or in if, you know, whatever our themes are. And as a visionary, kind of our problems is we have, you know, 20 ideas a day. Um, only a couple of them are probably any good. Um, but sometimes we can be, you know, shiny object and we can be bouncing back and forth and we really need to know who we are as a person and what we stand for, what type of company we want, what type of department do we want, or what type of individual do we want to be. Uh, and, and building that strong core is something that, um, that uh, you need to do in order to be a strong leader. And being that strong leader will help you lead through all the pain points that you know are inevitable you'll have. Um, I, I like this book here, The Dichotomy of Leadership. It's kind of a the next book in the series of extreme ownership, it really boils it down of the choices that leaders have to make and how they can adjust. And some people say, well, no, 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 I was forced to do it this way because I had no other options. Oh, no, <laughs> you had options, um, but you, you, you chose the wrong one or you didn't look at things uh, the right way. And the book is really, really good with how it lays that out. All right, so with that, hopefully you understand a little bit of how to identify your pain points that you know it's going to happen for sure, right? That it it will happen, it's okay. Uh, and then how to get to the root cause and then how to, to solve them and solve them on a company level and a personal level. 
Uh, so thank you so much for, for being part of this uh, Whisper University broadcast. And if we have any questions, you can put them in the, the comments. I'm happy to, to answer those, those questions you might have. And uh, hopefully this has helped you out.